Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the CDR Pants Hangout. My name is Joe Grabowski. I'll be your host for today. Um, absolutely thrilled uh, to welcome Jut Wynn back today. Jut's uh, done uh, Exploring by the CDR Pants Hangouts in the past, uh, but he's recently just returned from an expedition to China, so he's going to share a little bit uh, with us today. So just to introduce Jut, Dr. <coughs> Jut Wynn. He's a conservation biologist and explorer. He's bushwhacked through the jungles of Belize in China, rappelled into the deepest volcanic pit on the big island of Hawaii, and endured the world's driest desert in northern Chile. He's used cutting-edge instruments on board NASA aircraft, and he's traveled to the most remote inhabited place on Earth, Easter Island, where I believe he was there this summer. And all this to learn more about caves and the secrets they may contain. Jut, absolute pleasure to have you joining us again today. Thank you so much, Joe. Pleasure to be here. All right. Well, I know you've just returned from uh, an expedition to China. I was able to follow along a little bit on Facebook and see some of the, the pictures and the places you visited. And I'm very excited for you to share that with our classrooms joining today. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Glad that everyone can be here with us this afternoon. And what I'm going to do is let's go ahead and get this uh, PowerPoint loaded. Let's see. Actually, let me see. Let me check something real quick. Okay, yeah. All right. Okay, here we go. All right, so what I'm going to be talking about today, as you can see from the title, the very bizarre cave animals of Guangxi, China. Now, Guangxi, China is in southern China, and I'm going to be showing you all a map here shortly. Uh, but first, let's just kind of go over what we're going to be discussing, what you all are going to learn about today. So first, because this is a cave talk, we're going to go over some very key, important key terms and concepts related to cave ecology. Uh, I'm also going to provide a little bit of information about China and the cave and, and the environment in China as well. And then I want to share with you all some of our preliminary results. And basically what this is going to be is just a lot of really cool pictures of cave animals that I photographed while working in China. And as Joe just mentioned, I recently got back from this expedition. I was in China conducting this expedition in late November. So this is almost hot off the presses. It's uh, you know just a few months old in terms of um, us doing this work. And we're still working on identifying the animals that uh, we collected and we're also actually processing uh, some soil and, and water samples that we collected as well. So first let's look at the cave environment. Okay, so this is a, a schematic, a cartoon of uh, an idealized cave here. And what we know about caves is that you, if you, for those of you who have been into caves, you know that there, they are, there are distinct zones within caves. And if you're standing in the entrance, well obviously there's light, and that's where photosynthesis can occur. And as you're walking from the entrance of the cave to the deepest portion of the cave, it gets darker and darker until it is completely dark. And so we've divided that, scientists have divided this into four different zones, a light zone, twilight zone, transition zone, and deep zone. And what we see is we see that along this zonal gradient, the habitats, the, the climate is slightly different. It becomes the climate becomes more and more stable as you go from the entrance to the back of the cave. The back of the cave typically represents the average annual surface temperature. It is typically characterized by low to no airflow. And if it has true deep zone conditions, it's, it's uh, described as having a near water saturated environment. It looks like a big, clock, a big fog bank when you go in to the deepest part of the cave. And that's where the cave adapted animals hang out. That's where they really uh, like to be and that's where they're able to make a very good living. And as we would expect along the zonal gradient, what we'll see is we'll see that animals will select habitat along that zonal gradient. For example, some bats will, will roost only within the twilight zone. So the cave is very important and we can see that there are different habitats for animals along the zonal gradient. So let's discuss some of the, the different functional groups, the different types of animals, the different groupings of types of animals that occur within caves. The first one is known as a troglobite. 
Now, a troglobite is just a fancy ecological word that means an animal that must occur, that, that must live in caves only. It, it, has, it requires the cave to complete its entire life cycle. It cannot go to the surface. It cannot go to the entrance of the cave to make a living. It has to live in that deepest part of the cave called the deep zone. And as you can see, this is a cave adapted centipede. You can see that they typically have no eyes or highly reduced eyes, very long antenna, very long legs. And you can see here in this image that they're covered, they're typically covered in hair. And, that, and the hair becomes their eyes underground. It helps them to, to find food. It helps them to find mates. It helps them to find shelter. Our second cave functional group are called troglozines. Now, troglozines are animals that require a cave for at least a part of their life cycle. And the best examples of troglozines are bats and crickets. Now, what these animals do is they will either roost or den in the caves during the day, and then they will exit the cave to forage at night. Our final cave functional group, they're called troglophiles. Now, troglophiles are animals that occur within caves, can complete their entire life cycle underground, but can also occur in similar cave-like environments on the surface. And this is an example of a, a beetle that was actually named after me that's from uh, North Rim Grand Canyon. And these animals are found in caves. They're also found underneath rock piles. You might even find them underneath uh, logs or within rotting logs. So those emulate kind of cave-like environments that these animals are going to be selecting for as well. So let's discuss the importance of cave roosting bats. So first of all, cave roosting bats are known as keystone species to ecosystems. And what a keystone species is, is if you think about a, a stone arch, and at the very top of that arch is the keystone. And if you pull that, if you remove that stone from the center, that keystone, the entire arch will collapse. And that's the idea behind a keystone species. Bats are very important to caves because they bring in nutrients from the surface in the form of guano or poop. Obviously, these animals do not go outside to use the bathroom. I guess that would be a little more polite, but they don't do that. They go in the cave. And when they go in the cave, over time, a lot of guano or poop accumulates in the cave. And this becomes an important nutrient source for all kinds of animals. And an entire ecosystem can be created around the bat guano. Also, bats are considered keystone species for tropical forests. And China, where I was in China, was a tropical for is a tropical forest. And what bats do for tropical forests is they're very important for pollinating tropical plants. And in some cases, the bats are so tightly linked with an association with a plant that they might be the only bat that pollinates that particular plant. And they also disperse seeds. And what they do is they will eat fruit. And as they fly somewhere else, they will, they will take a poo, they will defecate. And when they do, they drop the seeds in that new location. And this is something that is really important for us humans to know because bats are very important to people. They provide what are called ecological services. Now, several years ago, the United States Geological Survey did a study to estimate how much, how much in, in monetary terms, how much in money bats provided United States agriculture. And they estimated that it was $3.7 billion per year. That's a lot of money, $3.7 billion. And the reason why bats are so important is they eat insect pests. And there's a, there's a bat cave in, in Austin, Texas, where when you can use Doppler radar, the same type of radar that we use for tracking storms, and you can see the bats when they exit the cave at night, they fly directly towards the agricultural fields. So bats are very important. And in Southeast Asia, bats are no different. They're very important there as well. And there's one fruit called the king of fruits. It is durian. This is a picture of durian. And 
For one country in, that, that I was able to find information about, in it's Thailand, $170 million per year is generated from the sale of this type of fruit. Now, you might wonder why I'm talking about this, and the reason why is because there is a bat that is primarily responsible for pollinating durian. And if there was no bat, there would be no durian. And then there would be that revenue stream, that money that that country could make would be eliminated from the equation. Now, these bats are also important for pollinating bananas, and they also pollinate mangroves, which are these forests that occur along streams and along the coast, which are where, which are considered nurseries for a lot of fish species, which we then eat as well. So you can see that bats are very important for multiple reasons in Southeast Asia. So now what I want to do, and I was saving this for later, is me eating durian. Now durian fruit, the taste and smell of durian fruit has been compared to dirty, unwashed socks sitting in the bottom of a gym bag to rotting meat. So in the name of science, I thought it was wise of me to try durian fruit. And this is me eating durian. As you can see, I did not like it too terribly much. It is indeed an acquired taste. And I would like to compare it more to, for me, it tasted more like, a, uh, I guess I'd say a rotten onion is kind of what I, what I thought it tasted like. So let's move right along to China here. And let's look at the animals that we found in China. So, so just, or my apologies, uh, an overview of the animals in China. So first off, I'd like to say that there's very little information known or uh, that has been collected on animals that dwell in caves in, South, in China. But what we do know is that in Southeast Asia in general, that the diversity, the biological diversity of cave adapted animals is one of the highest in all of the tropics across the world. So Southeast Asia is believed to be very, very important for cave adapted animals. But what I would have to say is that the, the biological diversity within Chinese caves is per, poorly known. There's not a lot of information out there. So the work that, that colleagues and I were doing was really considered cutting edge in that regard. But what we do know is that there are about 142 different cave adapted animals that are currently known. And through this work that we just completed, we're hoping that we will contribute more to that number of species. So we're thinking we can probably increase this number by maybe 10, 15 animals. For cave roosting bats, 77% of the bats that occur in China roost in caves. That's 101 out of 131 different species. But the problem is, is that bats have been declining in the past 30 years across China. So there used to be a lot of bats and now, they're, and now those populations are starting to have been recorded as being in decline over the past 30 years. Now this is because of development, this is because of habitat loss, and probably something a little more difficult to, to determine is it's also likely due to contamination, uh, pesticides, herbicides, and just overall smog in, uh, that occurs largely throughout China. And then also another very important thing to mention is that human disturbance to caves is also a huge problem. And some bat species are so incredibly sensitive that you, if you simply go into a cave and shine a flashlight in that cave, the bats will abandon the cave. And if the bats have baby bats in the cave, sometimes they will abandon the baby bats and then those baby bats will die. And from our work in, in China, this is what we learned in terms of, of the types of impacts that are currently threatening cave ecosystems. First, um, the concrete that we have in our, on our city streets that build that we use to make our buildings, they're typically used, we typically extract or excavate limestone to make that cement. And that is that is a huge problem in China, especially for caves. 
Also deforestation, the loss of deforestation in surface vegetation in general is a big problem for caves because what happens is when you remove the vegetation, if there's then a big, once it rains, it, as a result, what will happen is all that sediment will erode and will wash into the cave. And that can be bad for cave adapted animals because that changes the environment. And sometimes, and well, most of the time, they're not able to adapt quickly enough and we can lose those populations as a result. Also urbanization, the more cities you have, the, the larger the cities are, the more demands there are for water, the more, and as a result of that, that can affect the cave ecosystems because that affects the type, the amount of water that's available to the caves because caves are underground and we get our water underground. And then finally, pestis, increased pesticides and fertilizer is also a problem. Now, this is a picture of me looking, uh, that I took looking over the mountains while standing on the Great Wall of China. And that is not clouds that I'm looking at to see the sun. That is, I'm looking through this thick layer of smog. And I call this the Great Wall of Smog. It is unbelievable how smoggy, how polluted some parts of China are. Now, the, the Chinese government does have a lot of policies that they, they put forward, but these are recommendations. I call them paper policies. They recommend certain practices to protect the environment. But the problem is, is that China, China has undergone this incredible and impressive uh, expansion and development in its culture and its, in its society. And as a result, the growth of their economy has outweighed or outpaced environmental protection. So things are very different in China than they are in Canada and in the US. We have policies that are in place to limit the amount of pollution. Unfortunately, China, while they have those policies, they're not regularly enforced and there's a lot of problems still in China. This is an example. This happened in last month in, in Northern China, that the smog was so bad that they had to cancel planes landing in Beijing. It wasn't possible for them to land. If you can imagine, if it's so bad that the planes can't land, it's probably pretty bad for people to breathe as well. And if you think about that, and I thought about this quite a lot, when I was in China, I realized that there are problems with pollution in China. And every time that I would buy fruit or vegetables in the market, or every time I would go out to eat with my friends, I would think about that. I would think about, okay, how pure, how clean is this food? Is this food contaminated that I'm eating? In most cases, it probably was. So let's move on to cave bugs and cave bats and all sorts of other fun stuff. So this is where I was working. This is, China. This is a locator map of China. And you can see here in the southern portion, at the bottom portion of your screen, you can see Guangxi province. And where we were working is we were working in and around the city of Guilin, and we were looking at four, we surveyed four different caves in that area. And this is what we were doing. First off, we were collecting cave sediment and water. And what we were doing is we were looking at the, we were going to, we're going to examine those samples for chemicals, agricultural chemicals like pesticides and herbicides, as well as heavy metals to see how contaminated the caves are. Because the idea is, is that caves might be partially protected because they're underground. So we want to test that hypothesis to see if that's really true. So that's what we're doing. We're collecting cave sediment and water samples to do that. And this is my colleague, Dr. Jitao Wang, collecting cave sediment. And what we're also doing is we were confirming the focal group that we were going to select for contaminant analysis because what we want to do is we want to look at the water and the soil, but we also want to look at the cave animals to see if there are contaminants and what the levels of contamination are in the actual cave animals. And we, we identified crickets to be our focal species because this is going to be part of a longer term study. So this is some of the earlier work, this baseline work that we're doing to support a longer term study. And finally, we went to the deepest parts of those four different caves to collect the cave, and we searched solely for cave adapted arthropods 
or insects, but we also collected other types of insects as well. Now this is a, a picture of what the area where we were working in looks like. You can see here that this is very, and this is very typical too. You will see that the lowland areas are typically cleared. There, there are growing crops in those lowland areas and there are people living in those lowland areas in these smaller villages. And then you have in the highland areas, you can see the caves up in the top uh, left portion of the screen. The, the highland areas are still covered by native vegetation and that's where most of the caves were. Here's just another example. And this is very typical. These are rice paddies that we're looking at here. And I really like this picture because this is, for me, this is very artistic because you can see the, the domes, these, these big towers of limestone, and then you see the chaff from the rice below, or at the mid portion of the screen here. And it kind of looks like the towers of limestone. Here's a picture of two men working in the fields and you can see that in, in, in rural China, people work the same way that they've been working for thousands of years. This, the gentleman in the blue shirt is working in his rice paddies and he has no shoes on. And that's, that's very common. When we, were walking into, when we were walking through the villages to the caves, there was one time where this, this elderly woman, she must have been, I would say probably in her early to mid eighties, she, she passed us by very, she was fast, she, she faster than me, and she had a shovel over her shoulder and she was barefooted and she was walking down the trail going to work. And where we were staying, we we're staying in the city of Guilin, which, gosh, if I recall correctly, I think it was 800,000 people or 500,000 people, so there's a lot of people. It's a bustling city. It's, it's small by, uh, by Chinese standards. Most of the cities have, you know, two plus million people. Um, but this is what it looked like when we were in the cities. And when we got out of the cities, well, we had a different type of traffic to deal with. And these are water buffalo. And we would, as we were driving through the smaller villages, this was a common thing that we would see. We would see water buffalo in the middle of the road. And, and you know, it's, it's the easiest way to move your large herd of water buffalo to walk right down the street. So as a result, we would have to stop and go around them. Uh, there was also a, uh, one morning we were trying to get to the caves and there was uh, this lady who was walking her ducks down the middle of the street. She had probably 30 ducks and she was walking them down the street to take them to a pond. So now let's look at some cave animals. And as I mentioned earlier, this is one of our focal species for contaminant analysis. Now it's pretty sad what we have to do to these guys. We have to collect them, we put them in alcohol, and then once in alcohol, we will then take them and they're going to be dried and then they're ground up. And then we look at the, the, the material that we grind up from the animals and we examine that for levels of contaminants. And we can see what chemicals and what pollutants are in the animal's bodies. We had two really cool species of snails that we found in two different caves. This is one of them. And this is another. And we believe that both of these are cave adapted. We did not find these anywhere else in the cave except in the very deepest part of the cave. This is, a, this is a sporacid spider, and this is a really neat animal we found. We don't know if these are two different species, but we did find this spider in two different caves that were uh, probably about 10 kilometers apart, so roughly about six miles apart. Here's, an, here's a picture of one from a different cave, and we called those troglozines because we don't know if they're cave adapted. You can see they have eyes. They have this really cool violet color on their legs and, and uh, uh, on their cephalothorax, on the frontal po front portion of their body there, and they're just they're really beautiful animals, but they're not completely white or depigmented like cave adapted animals typically are. Now, this is one of the, my favorite pictures that I took. This is another sporacid spider. These are called huntsman spiders. They're very fast, and you can see that it has something in its mouth, and that is a baby cricket. And if you look at its, if you look at the hind leg to the uh, to to the uh, the left portion of the body, you can see it's and the antenna of the cricket extending next to it, and then you can see in the mouth of the animal, you can see the legs of the cricket.
Now we found, we, we believe we might have found three different species of pseudoscorpions and we believe that these are probably going to be new species and they were found in the deepest parts of the cave and we believe that these are cave adapted. You can see here that they are not completely depigmented but I was able to determine by looking at them, uh, looking at the images that I took that these animals do not have eyes. So that is a very good indication of being cave adapted. And what pseudoscorpions are, as the name suggests, they don't have a long tail with a stinger like scorpions do. They're called pseudoscorpions because they're like scorpions, but instead of having that tail with a stinger, they have the venom sacs in their pinchers. So when they grab their prey, they can they envenomate it and then they can eat it. And this animal is very, very small. It's about the length of a grain of rice. So as you think about this, the type of animals that it eats is going to be much, much smaller. This is another picture of a pseudoscorpion. And like I said earlier, this is probably a different species. Now this is a very tiny animal and this is a very horrible picture, but this was the best that I could do with, with my macro lens that I had on my camera. This is a mite. We believe that this is a cave adapted mite. It was found in the deepest portions of one of the caves that we sampled. And this animal is about, what's well, less than the quarter of a length of a grain of rice. It's very, very tiny. Now this is an isopod, a terrestrial isopod. We also call them roly-polies. This was found in the deep zone of a cave. We believe this animal to be cave adapted as well. You can see it has that white deep pigmented uh, uh, appearance and it did lack eyes as well. Here's another deep pigmented animal. It's also, a, it's also a isopod and we believe it to be a troglobite as well. Now this one, was one that threw me through a loop. When I first saw this, I said, oh, this is another isopod. And then when I collected it, I was able to see that it had a lot of legs, a lot more than an isopod. And I then learned that it was actually a millipede. But you can see here that it's depigmented and it has no eyes. So this is considered a troglobite as well. What happened? Let's see here. Okay. This is, a, this is a species of millipede. Now this animal is not cave adapted. You can see that it has color on its body. It also has eyes. And this was found in about the middle portion of a cave. So it wasn't in the deepest part of the cave. And we're questioning whether or not this is a troglozine or actually it should be a troglophile. This animal is uh, believed to be a, a troglobite. Uh, you can see it does have some coloration associated with it, but it did lack eyes and it was found in the deepest part of the cave. Now this one is an animal that we will need to do some additional uh, analysis on. Right now we're questioning whether or not it's a troglobite. Now this is where things got really interesting for me. And, and as you can see here, what we're looking at is we're looking at a lot of millipede pictures. Now it's not because I just happened to take a lot of pictures of millipedes and not a lot of pictures of everything else. It was because there were just a lot of millipedes. We had a, a very high diversity of millipede species that we encountered during this work. This is one, this is, this is a, of a polydesmid, uh, the family's polydesmidae. This is completely white. You can see these really cool scoots of the animal. They, they're well extended. This is really neat too. This is another polydesmid of the same uh, genus. It's a different species. Once again, it's a cave adapted animal. And those scoots, the way they extend laterally across the body, it almost looks like there's some sort of defense associated with that, something that would protect them from predators. Uh, once again, that's just an idea. I, I have no idea if that's the case or not, but uh, these are the sort of things that an ecologist starts to think about when they see these very interesting specializations on these animals because certainly this has to be there has to be a reason behind why they have those scoots developed like that it has to per, it has to serve some purpose and this is one with just these very very impressive elongated scoots this is another cave adapted uh, polydesmid millipede and this animal 
to me, this, this, this looks like a, an ancient Chinese warrior. And I, I had discussed this with some colleagues and the idea is if this does prove to be a new species and we believe that it is going to, because we were the very first folks to sample these caves. If it is, we're going to name it after a warrior from the Han Dynasty in China. And the Han Dynasty was one of the uh, uh, dynasties that produced the most fearsome warriors. And to me, even though this is not a predator, this guy eats um, uh, decomposing material in the cave and fungi, but he still looks very warrior-like to me. This had to be one of my favorite pictures that I took. And one of the things about taking pictures of, of animals in caves is that for every one great picture that you take, you probably have 50, at least 50 pictures that are absolutely horrible and out of focus. And this was one of 50 that was just absolutely spectacular. You can see that everything is in focus on the animal, uh, at least the frontal portion all the way to almost uh, uh, more than halfway of the length of the animal. And you can see that it has this, this is a millipede. It has very long legs. It had lax eyes, has very long antenna. It's covered in hair. This is an absolutely spectacular example of a cave adapted animal. This is one of the best examples. This is like textbook. This is what you expect to see when you look up cave adapted animal. You would see a picture that looks like, uh, you would see a picture of an animal that looks a lot like this. Now this is something completely different. This is a, this is a centipede. This is, a, this is a predator that occurs in the caves. This is a troglophile, which means we think that the animal completes its life cycle underground, but can also be found in other, uh, other cave-like surface environments. This animal is very common in farmhouses. Um, you can see by the very bright red spots along its back, it is telling you, do not mess with me. I can pack a punch. And it can. These animals are highly venomous. And this animal is about, oh shoot, I would say between, it's about three inches. So what is that? Almost uh, eight centimeters in length. Very large centipede. And when I, when I saw my very first one in, when I, it was the first day of cave work, went underground and about 10, 15 minutes into the, into the world, all of a sudden this animal runs across the cave floor. And I thought it was a, I thought it was a mouse. And I looked down and it, it turned out to be a turned out to be a centipede. And then I'm scrambling for my camera and chasing it across the cave and uh, managed to get a couple of really good shots of this animal. There weren't a lot of bats in the caves that we went to. We observed only three bats, and this was one of them. And we believe this, we, we've identified it down to species, we think, and it's uh, Ronophilus aphilius uh, affinis, which is um, a very common bat that occurs uh, throughout the uh, throughout southern China and Southeast Asia. There was one cave that had a that had a small creek going through it that ran from one entrance all the way to the other, and as you would expect, there were going to be amphibians, and we encountered this frog within that cave. So let's wrap this up. So as I mentioned earlier, we were the very first scientists to go into this cave, to, to go into those four different caves and look for cave adapted animals. We were also the first scientists to conduct this type of uh, analysis where we were wanting to understand how polluted were the caves. So the, the work that we're doing is cutting edge work. And as a result of there being no biological inventories conducted prior to our study, this suggests that those animals that we found that were cave adapted are most likely going to be new species, species that are new to science. And this is something that I found really interesting as an ecologist and as a scientist, because although these caves were very close to human development, they, they were, you can see here, you can see these big towers of limestone right next to where people have been farming for thousands of years but the caves still were relatively intact in terms of being able to provide habitat for cave adapted animals. And one of the things that I learned through this work, and this is something that we all know in, 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 uh, across the world is, is when we, it's very important for us 
to, to better educate local communities why we should be in protecting environments, why we should, why their local environment is so important and why it is important to protect caves and other natural resources. A lot of times people, especially in, in this part of the world in, in Southeast Asia, what they eat, they don't have a lot of money. So what they grow is what they eat. And as a result of that, they don't have the luxury of being able to think about protecting the environment because they're too busy trying to feed themselves and feed their families. So we need to promote the importance of natural resource protection and be able to demonstrate to these local communities why it's important not to use a lot of pesticides, not to use pollutants and to, be, and to protect the environment because protecting the environment not only protects the cave animals, but it also protects the bats that pollinate the trees, that pollinate the fruit trees, and it also protects the environment for them because they would have cleaner water that they would be able to use on their crops and they would have better air to breathe. So these are all things that are very important that we here in the United States and in Canada, I think we often take this for granted because in other parts of the world, things are very different. This was the research team. We were a very small team of only three people. And there were a lot of people to thank because when you work in other countries, you have to rely on the assistance of other people that are there to help you get the work done. And this project was no different. And here's my social media contact information. Uh, please feel free to contact Joe. And if you have any questions that I do not get a chance to answer during this work or during the end of this talk here, uh, please uh, contact Joe. And Joe has my email address and can, and can relay the questions to me. So with that, thank you very much. Or, or Sheshe, which is Mandarin for thank you. All right, Jot. Well, thank you for that. That was... That was awesome. It really gave us a picture of where you were, um, who you were working with, and some of the, the creatures you've discovered. And it's neat to be doing something like this. Like you said, this is hot off the presses. So not a lot of people know about the species in some of these caves. So thanks so much for sharing today. Oh, my pleasure. Absolute pleasure. All right. And if you just hit share, there you go. You're back. All right. I'm back. Well, let's meet some classrooms. Let's get some questions going. So. Our first group joining us is uh, Mrs. Boyle's grade fives are joining us from Fort Benning in Georgia. Let me turn their microphone on. All right, go ahead with some questions. Do I unmute it? Unmute it? Oh. Um, why did you decide to share your first, your discoveries with young students? Also, what can we do now if we'd like to become an ecology expert? So first, the reason why I want to share my work with you all is because it is very important to me to, to share my passion for science and exploration. It's, and, and by doing that, what my hope is, is that some of you all will get excited about science, really get excited about science. It doesn't have to be ecology. Maybe it'll be engineering, maybe it'll be, maybe it'll be physics, who knows? But to get you thinking and to get you interested in the natural world, that's why I do this. And to me, this is the most important part of my job, is to be able to share this work with you all in hopes that you all will get excited about science. Now, what can you all do to become ecologists or to become scientists in general? First, and this is very important, Cool. Being smart is cool. It is very cool. Don't ever forget that. How many people of you, how many of you all would say that astronauts aren't cool? Are astronauts cool? Yes. Astronauts are very cool, right. Astronauts, they have PhDs and most of them are scientists. So you got to be smart to be an astronaut. You got to be smart in life to do well. So, so science, so, you know, doing well in school is very important to be an ecologist, do well in math, 
do well in all your sciences, and, and most importantly, question everything, everything. If someone tells you A plus B equals C, just don't go, oh, okay. No, why does A plus B equal C? You need to understand why. And if you don't understand why, say, doesn't make any sense to me. I don't understand. And then go figure it out. Or ask somebody who, is, who understands to please explain it to you better. So being curious. Curiosity is the most important thing to being a good scientist. All right. Great questions and great answers. So we'll try and swing back if we have time. But let's meet our next class, Mrs. Hastings Specs Group. They're joining us from Brampton, Ontario. And they are a group, I believe, grades six through eight. Is any of the creatures poisonous? Are any of the other creatures poisonous? Well, in caves, there can be, well, there, there aren't really a lot of, well, yeah, golly, maybe half. I don't know. Um, if you think about spiders, all spiders are venomous because all spiders, that's how they, that's how they eat. They, they, they will grab the prey. They will envenomate the prey. And once they do that, the prey just sits there and does this and they can eat. So you got to have venom to be able to make a living like that. So spiders are venomous. Scorpions are venomous. You saw that the pseudo scorpions, they're venomous. You, you have uh, centipedes, they're venomous. Um, and we also, in one of the caves, which was upsetting to me, some of the villagers had gone in and put down what, I don't know how this stuff works, but it was this powder, and it was in Chinese, so I, I couldn't read it, but my friends could. And it said that it was uh, anti-snake powder, and, and it had a cobra on it. So we were thinking that maybe there was a cobra in the cave and that they went in and, and put the uh, powder down to a poison to, to make sure that there wouldn't be snakes there in the future. Um, so yeah, there, there can be poisonous snakes in caves. Uh, when I work on, uh, uh, in caves on North Rim Grand Canyon, uh, there were several occasions where there were rattlesnakes that were actually denning in the entrances of the caves. So each time we would go into the cave, before we would go in, we would have to throw a couple of rocks into the cave. We weren't trying to hurt the snakes. We were just trying to let them know that we were coming in. And because rattles, rattlesnakes are very polite animals. If, if they're there, they'll rattle. They'll let you know. They'll tch, 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 tch. Very polite. So that's what we did. We waited to hear the rattle. And if we didn't hear the rattle, then we could go into the cave. All right. Let's meet our next class. We have Mrs. Searson's group. They're joining us. They're a grade three, four class in Douglas, Ontario. Um, your microphone should be on now. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Mason? How many, how many species, how many species live their whole lives in caves? In oh, China. golly. Do you want me to make something up or do you want me to tell the truth? <laughs> tell the truth. It's going to be a lot easier for me to make something up. Um, you know, there... As I mentioned earlier, in China, right now, we know of about 145 different species. That, that's how many we know about. And, and that's how science works, especially in, in areas that are very difficult to get to. Um, the, the way that we know how many there are is by how many we've collected and have been able to identify. And another interesting thing about, uh, aspect about knowing how many cave adapted animals there are in a given region is that you also have to formally describe the animal because I can, all those animals that I shared with you all today, all those really cool pictures of these cave adapted animals, I can say that they're all new species, but until we write a scientific paper that describes, formally describes the animal, that describes all the little characters of the animal, animal to make it, to, to show that it's a new species, until we do that, it is just, an animal in a museum somewhere. It's just another specimen. So when we say that there are a certain number of new species in a given area, or a certain number of cave adapted animals in a new area, that's based on the science. So right now, maybe 150 different species in China, 
Um, globally, I, I've heard a lot of different numbers, but I, I heard a number a while back, 50,000. Um, but I, I would not uh, hang my hat on that. I would not say that I, I'm confident in that number because I really don't know. I would have to sit down and go through all the literature and compile a list to know exactly how many cave adapted animals there are on the planet. All right, good question. Uh, Very good question. Yeah, we're gonna jump to Brampton, Ontario, grade four class, Mr. Wigmore's class. Uh, your microphone should be on. Is there any <laughs> large animals in the cave? People. Is there any large animals in the cave? Yeah, I, I, I said people. We're the, we're the biggest animals in the cave. Um, when I was working in Belize several years ago, the largest animal that we saw in a cave was a jaguar. But we didn't actually see the jaguar. We saw the footprints in the mud of a very large cat. And we knew that jaguars use caves in Central America. So we can say that we think that it was a jaguar. And when I wrote the scientific paper to talk about that, I put jaguar with a big question mark. Because unless we see it with our eyes, or unless we can confirm it using some other type of analysis, like we take the poop from the jaguar and do a DNA test, we don't, we're not certain. But most likely it was a jaguar. But in China, biggest animals were us. All right, and our final class joining us, they are in uh, Kelowna, British Columbia, grade seven group, Mrs. Simone Choney's group. Uh, your microphone is on. How many new species were discovered in the caves? Um, you know, I don't know. Uh, as, as I was mentioning earlier about new species, it, it's a long process, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll and I'll condense that down to make it very short. We collect the animals. We then we then either have to formally describe the animals. Five minutes. We got five minutes left. Oh, sorry. No, someone from the class next door just asked me a question. Okay. Um, so so in order well to answer your question about new species in China, we don't know because it's a long process. What we have to do is we have to, after we collect the animals, we identify them to the best of our ability using the resources that we have, myself in particular. And then if I think it's a new species, I then send it to someone who specializes in that group. For example, someone who studies only millipedes and is like, you know, the king of all millipedes. He knows everything about millipedes. Well, not everything, but most everything. And then, and then he, he or she will then take those samp those specimens and then we'll look at them very closely and then start to take all these notes and start to draw the different parts of the animal that are different. And then we have to submit that to a science journal to be published. And then once that's done, then we can say it's a new species. So what I can say now is that we think we might have new species, but it's very difficult because I could be wrong. Uh, so I always say this might be a new species. So for China, we might have maybe 10, maybe five to 10. Uh, but once again, I, I'm, it, it's, it's an educated guess. And the reason why I can say maybe five to 10 is because we were the first scientific team to go into that cave and, or into those four caves and collect. And as a result of that, if you're the first, then you're the first to, to fish the bugs out of the cave and then, as a, by extension, you're most likely uh, to be, if you see anything that looks interesting, it's most likely to be new. All right. Well, Jack, what I think we'll do now is we'll sign off for the, the on-air portion, but any classrooms who can stick around, uh, if you don't mind answering a couple more questions, uh, we can do it that way so that they can stick around and get a few more in. Of course. Okay. All right. So I want to thank everybody for joining in today. I want to thank our classrooms. Um, for joining in with today's discussion and Jut for an, an awesome presentation uh, that you did put together for us. I think they definitely learned a lot. Um, what I'll do now is turn the mics on, give the classrooms a chance to say goodbye and thank you, uh, and we'll go off air. But any classrooms that can stick around, uh, we'll answer a few more questions. 
So here we go. Microphone's coming on. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining in. Thanks, everyone. It was a pleasure. Jut, thank you so much. We're signing Stay off for hard. today. Um, until next time. Until